I've been accused of a lot of things uh, by those who know me and those who don't. Um, I think I'm funny. So that's why I say I've been accused of a lot of things. I mean, when I say I think I'm funny, it's, you know, like, um, what did the dad buffalo say to the son buffalo when he was leaving? Bye, son. I think I'm funny. See, some of you got that before I said it, and then others of you are still going, what? Bye, son. Another name for a buffalo is a bison? Bye, son. No, you missed, missed the point of my explanation. I, I can see the faces of people, and I feel for you, those of you still in the clouds, of what, what did has happened right there. Like I say, it, so um, I, I'd also felt the need to sometimes, and it's crazy in our house, but our coping mechanisms, which are good ones, sometime in the midst of tough stuff, coping mechanism that God gave us is laughter. Sometimes you've you got to have a little joy in your life and a little laughter and a little craziness, and I bring that to my house at every chance I get, okay? Some of it's unintentional, and some of it's intentional, okay? Uh, but I, I thought this morning an appropriate way to start, which leads right into my message, is the story about the three guys who back in the day were in the waiting room. They were in the waiting room expecting the news from the doctor who was about to come out and tell them of their recently born children. The doctor comes out, addresses the first one, and says, hey, good news, there's two. And the guy says, that's amazing. I work for the Minnesota Twins. Two babies, twins. He runs out of the room all excited. A few minutes later, the doctor comes out and says to the next guy, you won't believe this, but it's triplets. And the guy says, incredible. He says, I work for 3M. At the same time, the third guy gets out, starts to run out of the room, and the doctor says, whoa, hold on, what are you doing? He goes, oh, man, I work for 7-Up. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Robert Proctor told me that, and if I can make people laugh, it was Robert's joke this morning. But the point of it that Robert was telling me about was, you know what? When life happens, we can't run, ar- run away from it. It's the, it's the hand we've been dealt in some weird kind of way. So I'm leading into what we're going to talk about this morning is we're walking into the circumstances of life right now as a church, as friends, as people, as a community. As a nation, as a world, huh? This whole last couple of weeks, just look around, right? You've got the tragic moments of the police shootings. You've got the Dallas situation. You've got the awful, awful situation in France that went down. So we, we live in this kind of broken world. And I'm here to tell you this morning that sadness and sorrow and pain are a part of this world. And this morning, I want us, instead of turning and running from them and and essentially hiding, let's run toward them. Because I believe by running toward them, God's going to take us places we could never imagine in our walk with him. He wants to to take us deeper. You see, in John 16, 33, we're going to try to work this out, Debbie and I, because I created some pictures and some slides. We're going to try to work this out. In John 16, 33, this is what Jesus tells the disciples. He says, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. That's John chapter 16, verse 1, because this is what he's leading to. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now listen, in this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. Does that sound like an iffy moment? Like, hey, there's an exception. No, it's just a plain statement followed by this unbelievable unbelievable promise but he says although you're gonna have trouble take heart because why i've overcome this world i have overcome this world he spends the 16th chapter telling his disciples about in a sense how difficult things are going to be in fact back into the 15th chapter he tells them you are the vine and the branches to remain in me because he goes on to say because i chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, do you believe this morning that God has chosen you and that your life matters? He does. He does. That verse, verse 16 is my life verse. I chose it a long time ago, entering the ministry. I've chosen you to bear fruit and fruit that will last. In other words, I want you to be involved in the life stuff that's everlasting. 
That's your verse too. It's not just mine. It's the choosing of everyone. God looks at you and he says, I chose you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now listen, in order to do that, he said earlier, you've got to remain in me as the vine is in the branch. And you've got to understand following that, he says, the world is not going to be your friend. The world, in fact, the world is going to hate you for the things that you believe. Verse 6, chapter 16, he starts, I told you all this so you won't fall away. Because he knows that when trouble comes, our tendency is to fall away. To back up. And I'm going to ask you this morning to be people of courage to move forward. I believe this morning what we'll talk about is a message for every one of us in the room, including the people, if you will, that aren't in the room that you know, because either you're in trouble or you're about to be in trouble. It's not a statement about something you're going to do. A lot of what we'll discuss this morning is just the world you live in, the broken, fallen, sinful world. And because it's broken, because it's fallen, because it's sinful, there's trouble on your horizon. I couldn't tell you what. That's not the point today. It's to get us ready. It's to understand what he says here is you're all going to have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Rely on your faith. Your faith is essential to this moment. So first thing I put on the back of your Sunday paper today, okay, in an outline form is that verse. And then here are four just personal observations I have. And backing up because uh, to make assumptions is a bad deal, right? So everyone in the house today, we as a local church, this group of people, what Brad was referring to is we're on a difficult journey of our own. Recently, we lost one of the members of our worship team, Annie. I want to make sure everyone knows where we're coming from. We're coming from the difficult moments of losing her as a local group of people, and it was a much wider influence that she had. But you're here for the first time today, and you don't need to really know Annie to know about where we're going this morning, because it's about how to deal with pain and sorrow and difficulty. So as we embrace that moment this morning, I personally, in these last couple, three weeks, have had some personal observations. I just want to reaffirm them with you. The first one is, what I just said, is we will all have pain and trouble. I want you to understand the promises are, lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. The promises are, you are never outside of the presence of God. But because God walks with you, does not exclude you from pain or sorrow or difficulty. Okay? You are always, never, ever, ever will be left alone. He will always walk with you, in front, behind, alongside of you. But sometimes the walk will be difficult. We will all have this struggle. Two, those who move toward the sorrow and sadness will find a new depth to their faith. And I've discovered this in life because I, I think we all start this way. We all start with expectations, and then when trouble comes, we back up. And I'm, I'm finding out, the longer I'm alive, I'm finding out that those people who I really see growth in their life are the people that walked toward the sadness and the trouble and said, not why, now listen, not why, but what? They didn't ask why. Listen, I'm I'm just okay with the fact that why is just not a good question. There's just things that God only knows. There's just moments in your life and my life and circumstances that the why thing is going to remain a mystery. But the what thing is what God has intended for us. Is what do you have for me, God? If all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose, then that verse becomes the what question. Where I am now, God, what? Are you going to take me somewhere personally? Do you have someone for me to reach out to? See, the what question becomes the question. And my fear this morning in saying that is that we were just programmed to kind of skim through life. And we don't embrace the difficult moments, and we miss the what. Well, I think I've told you before, those of you who come here, that my favorite movie is a Field of Dreams movie. There's a scene in Field of Dreams where it, it's all about opportunity. One character saying to another about his missing um, a major league experience in baseball. But this is what he says. We just don't recognize the most significant moments of our life while they're happening. And I just want to tell you all, this is a significant moment. It's significant for this local church, this local community, and then just keep going. 
It's significant in this state. It's significant in this nation. It's significant all around the world. Right now is a significant moment. And those who walk into the significance are going to see God unfold some things they never saw possible. Walking toward it, not away from it. The third thing that I just wanted to recognize with you is God doesn't waste anything. There are not moments or or circumstances that God says, you know, just get through that one. Everything is used by God. Your hurting heart is being used by God. Your sensitivities that have risen to the right things in the last couple weeks and months are being used by God. (laughs) Your ability now to, to trivialize what should be trivial is being used by God. He's rearranging. He's redoing some of the inner stuff in you. And that's a good thing because he doesn't waste anything. And lastly, help is found in faith and those who have walked the path of pain and sorrow. In other words, what you're saying about this morning is true, that our hope is found in what we believe, I still believe, but it is also found by embracing people who have walked the path before you. Leading me into the fact that uh, Tuesday before Annie's memorial service, Brad, our worship leader, said to me, hey, have you seen this message on North Point Community Church's website by a man who's walking through pain and sorrow. He says, it's outstanding. And I said, no, I haven't had time to yet, but post the memorial service, I saw it, and the rest of the content today, in fact, the title of the message, Through the Eyes of a Lion, is a message that's been given, that was given at North Point three weeks ago by a man named Levi Lusco. He's a pastor out in Montana, church planner, pastor, The story is built in the loss of his five-year-old daughter. 2012, five days before Christmas, Levi held his daughter and she died in his arms, five years old, of an asthma attack. His message then, through the eyes of a lion, is how he relied on his faith and saw God do things through his life in the midst of this difficult moment. I ordered 20 of the books. They didn't get here in time. I've finished the book, which comes, the title of the message came from the book that he wrote, Through the Eyes of a Lion. At the end of the message, should you be inspired, there's a sign-up sheet out there, but next Sunday there'll be 20 of his books here to purchase. It is an incredible book for those of you who have lost someone. Incredible. It is raw. (laughs) It talks about the really painful stuff of losing a child. Really raw, but to the point. So the rest of what I'll share with you this morning, he does a more excellent job by far than I will. But sometimes what you have to do, which I just said, is you have to look to and learn from people who have gone where you haven't gone yet. So I needed someone to say, well, how would you handle the loss of someone really close to you? I found great solace in what he preached that day, and I bring that to you in this way. He starts with this illustration. In 1990, the Hubble telescope was launched at the cost of $1.5 billion. It was to send back images from space that we'd never seen before. When the images came back, they were blurry. $1.5 billion to send back blurry images. Scientists got together. They figured out that Hubble was farsighted. Just like you and I, they figured out that there was a lens that they needed to send into space to have attached to Hubble's lens that was the width, uh, let me get this right, it was 1 50th the width of a piece of paper. They sent it to space, immediately the images became crystal clear, and from Hubble we've seen things we never saw before. Now, when the pictures were blurry, it wasn't the universe's fault, it wasn't the Milky Way's fault, it was the fault of a bad lens. How you and I live today is a result of which lens we're living through. You see, we can't live in the way God wants us to live until we see the way God wants us to see. The rest of this message is about looking at life, pain, and difficulties through the right lens. Suffering, he writes, or says, he also writes it, is not an obstacle to you being used by God, it's an opportunity. To be used by God like never before. God wants to use you in the midst of your pain and your suffering. But he needs you to stop hiding, to not blame people, and not ignore the significant moments. 
Your pain, he will say later, and I'll get to later, is your opportunity. He encourages us all to see life beyond what it is, like watching and seeing life through a telescope. A telescope helps us to get beyond the circumstances, the things we can see here, and see the far-reaching things, to see the things that you and I can't see yet. He also encourages us to understand that a lion, right, he wrote the lion part of it, is one related to his daughter's name, but two related to the lion's ability to see. A, a lion can see six times better than a human being. They have more rods than cones. They have bigger pupils. But incredibly, what I never noticed before until he brought this out, is each lion has a white stripe beneath their eyes. Do you know how the athletes do the black stripe kind of stuff? Rob, you know you know, athlete, you know, black stripe kind of stuff to deflect light. A lion has a white stripe to bring more light in. You see, they don't have, there's not more light in the jungle. It's they make better use of the light. It reflects into their eyes to see. Now, you and I, we all have the same opportunity to see the light. We have the written word of God. There's not more or less light. It's our receptivity to it, our opening our eyes to the word of God. It's taking better advantage of the light. So point number one is, what I said in the telescope, is to look beyond. Point number one, the way we're going to deal with it is to look beyond. How we look beyond is looking through the Word of God. Romans ten seventeen, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. As you embrace pain and sorrow and suffering, run to the Word of God. And in the Word of God, you'll see a focus that helps you to live beyond. It'll open your eyes to where God is. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there's a great story about Elisha and his servant, and uh, they're in an encampment, and uh, word's gotten out that Elisha's uh, ratting out the enemy all the time. Every time the enemy of Israel goes to make a move, Elisha warns the king of Israel what to do. Hey, they're going to go here, they're going to do this. And finally, the, the other king says, come on, what's going on? Is the guy sneaking into our camp? He said, no, he's the man of God. And he says, well, we need to get rid of this guy then. So they encircle, encircle Elisha and his servant. It's just two of them in a tent. And Elisha is, is he's not unaware, he's aware, but he's unafraid. Elisha can already see with the eyes of the Spirit. But he prays, in verse 17, he prays and he says, God, open the eyes of my servant that he can see what I see. And the servant looks outside the tent and sees the enemy. Now, don't get this wrong. He sees the enemy. But what he sees are the chariots and the God fighters equipped to do battle who have the enemy surrounded. Now, now listen, what you know is surrounding you. My marriage didn't work out. I don't know where my next bill payment on the house is going to come from. My kids are just not following God like I want to. Whatever is surrounding you, God has surrounded Whatever is surrounding you, God has surrounded. You see, take heart because I have what? I have overcome the world. You see, all those things are the power of the world. The power of the world is the broken relationships and the financial struggle and the kids, man. All that stuff is the world. And he says, take heart because what's surrounding you, I've got surrounded. Even, everyone, listen, Even death. Huh? Even death. The fear you and I have of dying, guess what? Even that which surrounds us and sometimes paralyzes us, he took care of. I have overcome the world. I have overcome even even death by my death, by my burial, by my resurrection. So what we fear, what we hold back from, which is surrounding us, Elisha wanted his servant to see, man, see what's surrounding that. And everything changed for the servant. Everything can change for you and I as we understand that as well. As we understand that we look beyond. The the enemy is still going to be there. That's the crazy part about that story. Not that the servant looked out and didn't see the enemy. In fact, he saw the enemy, but what he saw was they were surrounded by the soldiers of God. Look beyond. Our faith tells us to look forward, not backward. We are moving toward our home, not away from it. 
Now listen, this is some tough stuff, but man, it, it changes my attitude all the time. We, everyone in this room, we are not followers of God. We are not citizens of this world. We are aliens in this world. We are moving toward our home and away from a citizenship that we misunderstand is here. We are not. The moment you said yes to Jesus Christ, your citizenship was changed from that of the world to that of the kingdom of God or to that of heaven. And we are moving forward toward that real home. And see, this is a tough moment, right? Because we love stuff. We spent time on a lake yesterday. We, we did laps in a pontoon boat. This is crazy. When you get older, right, you go to a lake, you don't tube. You don't ski. You do laps in a pontoon boat at idle speed. Like, hey, hey. People are zipping by you. You're just like laid back, like you're just drinking your Diet Coke. Like, hey. So we had like eight, what, eight or ten of us in a boat. I'm not wrong. We did like eight laps. Uh, yeah, it's exciting, right? We, listen, we did laps in the pontoon boat. And I have no idea how that connects. <laughs> Seriously, that just, uh, it's not in here anywhere. I don't, it's not in here. All right, back on what we're talking about. Okay, we're moving forward, everyone. I don't know, it's just, I, I'm getting old. Okay, we're moving forward, but listen, this, is ama- this will change you. Listen, because of your faith, you are, fill in the blank, you are this many days, in fact, today, let's just do today, you are one day closer to your home, and you are one day closer, listen, you are one day closer to seeing that person you lost again. Our faith looks forward. Our faith doesn't look backward. When you look forward toward home, right? When you look forward to home, you can say, you know, Brad, he, finally today, he cried. He didn't cry much in the, in the funeral, but he cried today, okay? Listen, you know what you can say today? You know what you can say today about losing Annie? Not how many days she's been gone. But how many days closer you are to seeing her again? How many days you are closer? This every day you walk on this planet, you are one day closer to home. That's our faith in action. That's moving toward the pain. That's moving toward the sorrow and embracing people around you who are lost and confused because of, because your faith is based on I go to prepare a place for you. That place, he says, is where you enter because of your faith. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Because we believe, 1 Thessalonians, that we don't grieve like the rest who have no hope. But we believe that Jesus died and rose again and will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in him. That's moving forward toward your faith. That's understanding pain. That's knowing this is a sorrowful time. And it's a weight and it's a cloud and it's a fog. And all those kind of things are true, everyone. But listen, we are one day closer to home. And that energizes your soul. Because what it tells you is God doesn't waste anything. That this moment has refreshed my ideas of heaven. It has brought me that much clearer into focus that I'm not going to live here forever. Neither are you. This death thing is a crazy success rate. It's a hundred percent. But that's home, everyone. That's home. You're being called home. Every day you're alive. Paul says you're like a tent. Your tent is decaying. That's just pictures. Pictures. You're moving forward. You're moving forward. Point number two. In Romans 8, 19, there's a verse that reads, um, God is coming uh, back to redeem the world. The essence of the verse is that um, all of creation is groaning for redemption. Every, everything around you and me is waiting. It's like the book of Revelation kind of played out. The book of Revelation is really confusing, but ultimately what the book of Revelation says is one day God's coming back to hit the reset button. One day God's coming back and says to all this mess that's the world, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more tears. It's seriously like back in the old days when we couldn't make our computers work. You'd call someone and say, what to do? He said, did you turn it off and on yet? Seriously, that's essentially that's the book of Revelation. God's saying, turn it off. I'm turning it back on. 
And that verse says for you and I to have an eager expectation of God coming back and resetting the world. The world now of eternity, the world of no more pain, the world of no more sorrow, no more tears. That world, reset to that world. J.B. Phillips translates that verse. Listen to how J.B. Phillips translates it. I think the next one, Debbie, is, is Romans 8.19. For the creation waits in eager expectation, that's where the eager expectation for children of God to be revealed. Now listen to how J.B. Phillips translates that verse. This is awesome. The whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sights of the Son of God coming into their own. Now, in athletics, in boxing, and even as lions on the prowl, they all do it on their tiptoes. Right? Okay? Muhammad Ali. We just lost Muhammad Ali, right? Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, that kind of stuff, right? Do you think he fought like this? How do you fight? Going forward on his tiptoes, right? Watch a ball game, the ground ball to the shortstop. Oh, he makes an error. What do they say? Oh, he was flat-footed. How do they tell the fielder to field the ball? Oh, always be in anticipation. Always be... On your tiptoes. You tell your defenders, right, Nate? You're like, okay, when you're guarding that guy, what I want you to do is be backing up the whole time. Of course not. You're on your tiptoes. You're anticipating that ne- that person's next move. Now listen to it in a spiritual sense. We are to be on our tiptoes now because of our faith. So when trouble comes our way or difficulty comes our way, because we understand that God doesn't waste anything, that God wants to use us to make an impact in the world, that when trouble comes, we're on our tiptoes going, bring it on. Bring it on. It doesn't mean that you're not sad. It doesn't mean you don't hurt. What it means is you have something to live for. What it means is what you understand is that you're moving forward and see suffering as an opportunity. See, pain is a microphone, and the more it hurts, the louder you get. Pain is a microphone. The more it hurts, the louder you get. Was that not true in the last eight months here in this church? Was that not true? The more Annie's struggle went on, the louder she got, right? The more you and I suffer and embrace our suffering through our faith, the louder we get. People pay attention. Man, there is no voice like the voice of I've been there. Um, Go on YouTube and look up Danny Gokey's story, the guy who writes Hope Again and Let My Heart Beat Again. Watch the interview about him losing his wife. Because that's where these songs came from. When his pain got intense, his voice grew louder. One of the songs that the family used that we'll be doing here in the next few weeks, one of the songs the family used in Annie's celebration was a new song by Hilary Scott called Thy Will. It is a song of her struggle, deep, dark struggle, through miscarriages. And then... When the pain got more, her voice grew louder and she penned this amazing song that said, the only four words I can understand or trust in in the whole world are, thy will be done. Okay, so your pain, rather than shrinking back from it, is a microphone. Now, like a microphone, one I have on, or one that's handheld like this, what has to happen to the micro- for the microphone to be effective? Yeah, uh, get over the get over the obvious, okay? It's not on, okay? But what has to happen? You have to put the microphone in proximity to your life. This is why, when pain and suffering happen, I I am not that guy. Now, let me just clarify something. I get weirded out on television when they say so and so is playing today after his dad passed away yesterday because that's what his dad would want him to do. I am not that guy. I think it's a bit crazy. You need to embrace. The tough moments. You need to sit in the tough moments. You need to be okay with with sorrow just kind of knocking you off your feet, down onto your knees or into your chair. Live in it because living in it is where you hear God. So that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, in order for the microphone to be effective and to be loud, bring it close. Bring the pain close. Tell people that when you see them. I've never lost a friend this close to me. It hurts like mad. But I'm telling you, I'm going places I've never gone. That's bringing the microphone of pain close. The tendency in society is hurry up, get through it, move on to the next thing. 
Oh, hurry up, race again. Uh, play ball again. Hurry up, get past the loss. No. Live in the loss so that the loss and the pain can do the work of God in you. Because, we're going to discover this in another minute, there is someone who needs your story. There is someone who needs your story. But back to this, pain is a microphone. But I want you to just understand this, everyone, because now you're weirding out like, oh, great. He just told me that everyone's going to be in trouble and that I'm going to have pain. Listen, I don't understand this at all, but this is the truth of the Bible. The devil, the devil has to ask. He's under God's thumb. Now, listen, he had to come to God and say, Job, Peter, I want to sift that guy. Uh, I want to put Joseph in a well. God had to ask, or Satan had to ask permission. I do not understand why God said yes. Are you okay with that? I don't know why God said to you and your family, you're going to have a child that struggles. I don't know why God said to somebody else, you're going to miss this opportunity and and you're not going to have a baby. I don't know. I don't know why. Okay? I don't know why, but I know God was involved. And I know the end of Joseph's story, which is the end of all of these moments. Because at the end, when Joseph goes from the pit to the man in charge, Genesis 50.20 says, because what they meant for evil, God used for good. I don't know how, I don't get it, but I do know the outcome. Every time Satan has to ask, it is if, and I think Lusco said that this way, he says something about uh, that... God puts a virus into every plan of Satan, and that virus, at his time, always does the same thing. It wipes out the plan of Satan and brings into focus the plan of God. That's tough to understand and live through, but it's the truth. Again, it's which lens you see things through, the lens of the world's up or the lens of your faith through Scripture. Next slide. The third thing is that we do is, after eager eager expectations, is now there's a new normal in our world. There's things that have been rearranged. In this new normal, pain is now our passport. This is what I was getting to earlier. Okay, so you have all come into this room either in pain or about to be in pain. That's terrible news, but it's truth, right? But God wants to take that now as your passport. Now listen, because God is going to build his kingdom whether you participate or not. Is this right or not? I will build my church, he said. I will build the kingdom. Now listen, what he's asking you to do is take out your passport. When I go to another country, they say, give me your passport. What is it? It's an entrance into a new land. Here's the entrance into a new land. Pain, your passport, is the entrance into a new land for you and for someone else or someone else's. Currently, the number is 29. 29 people came to Jesus as a result of Annie's celebration service. 29, 27, the day of Annie's service, two more last week. Two more last week. Those those wristbands are about up there. They're not leaving. I've ordered more because there will be more people come to Jesus as a result. Now listen, what did I just say? I just said that there's a new normal and that your pain is now a passport to someone else. Do you know at work that person who just lost someone? Do you know what Annie's death is? A passport to talk to that person about your faith. An entrance into a new land and a new world. Listen, if you don't use your passport, it's worthless. I got one sitting on my dresser now. What good is it? I don't have to go to Dansville. I give a passport. Well, it is kind of a different world than Dansville, but whatever. (laughs) Weberville, whatever. Okay. But, But you know what I'm saying, right? A passport with no stamps in it? It's just sitting on a dresser. Come on, be bold. Take your passport with you wherever you go. Tell people, I'm hurting, I'm struggling, this is why. The the door just blew open everywhere. Kathy goes to the dentist at the end of her dentist appointment. They say, oh, she says, oh, it's been a really tough week. Blah, 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 where are you from, Williamston? Oh. That's what the lady, did she not say that? Oh. And then the door open. Take your passport. Open into a new land and say, she was my friend. I'm really struggling that we lost her. I was a part of the church she went to. 
what if the person... I was looking for a church. Huh? What if the passport is an entrance to that person to say, I don't get it. I'm struggling. I'm hurting. But I'm clinging to my faith. I still believe. You have a new normal now in your world. Everyone who's lost someone has heard somebody say this to them at some point in time. Because once you lose someone, you're never going back. Life is, is altered at that moment. There is a new normal for you. Okay? You're not going back there. You're going forward. New normal. Re- read this book. Listen to this message. Oh, my gosh. It's heart-wrenching. He talks about the new normal, Levi does, of going to restaurants and having them ask, how many people are in your party? And he says, every time I hear that, my heart hurts. Because it was Levi, let's go, party of, and now he says, party of five, and it was always party of six. And they go to board a plane, he says, and people say, look at him and his girls. And he goes, oh, are all these all your girls? And he goes, no, I want to tell the person, nope, we got one on another planet, and we got all of us here. It's a new normal. What he talks about is the new normal. He talks about leaving the hospital the night that she passed away, looking in the rearview mirror of his van and seeing her seat empty and being paralyzed to pull away. That's a new normal. It's a painful normal. All through this book that he writes is the pain of Luving's daughter. He, he does not dodge it ever in this book. What he says is, here is life now. And the fact of the matter is, he used his passport. And this is an incredible part of his story, right? I couldn't do this. I'm just going to be upfront with you. I don't think I can do this. He sits in the van after, brutal, after closing his daughter's eyes and walking out of the hospital. His wife says to him, it's five days till Christmas. Aren't you going to go back and invite those people to Christmas service? Are you kidding me, he thinks. She pulls out invitations and says, go back. He goes back. He says, I walk into a hospital, a blubbering whatever, and crying through the, here's a tech person, here's the EMT, here's people who helped my daughter. He walks out. And he writes in the book, two of those people who treated his daughter And another tech came and found Jesus five days later at the service that he preached. It's a new normal. And he says, I had a passport now into their lives. I didn't want the passport, but I accepted it. And I walked into that moment where God was working. We have a new normal, you and I. Anyone who's lost someone, you have a new normal. And what people are asking about is people are asking about our pain. How do you deal with the tough stuff? Then we now have a passport to say to them, my faith. Spurgeon said something like, God gives his most difficult assignments to his most trusted soldiers. I'm not so sure that's not true. Some of the people who suffer are more trusted people. And God sees their ability to handle that moment. Fourth point, last point. Two scare tactics on the way out the door. He talks about scare tactics in the end of the book, and he says it this way. He says, when you face these moments now, be ready to fight back. If you're on your tiptoes, right, and the devil's coming, he's bringing that stuff into your life, be ready to fight back. Here's a couple of ways to fight back, he says. One is the lion is the only social cat. This is cool. The lion is the only social cat. They travel in what? Huh? Prides. I like it. They travel in prides, right? Who does the hunting? The females do the hunting. I really like this part of it. <laughs> I'm all about this. The female, does, you know what the guys do? <laughs> Roar. <laughs> Don't you like that? I'm tough. Roar! And you're like, hey, honey, go get the food for, for dinner, will you? It, it's, actually, it's how it works. The male goes out into the hunting ground and bellows and roars, and all of the prey flee toward the females. Crazy moment, right? Yeah, not so far off. Here comes pain and suffering into your life. It screams at you. Night and day, screams at you. And what do you do? Who do you run to? I cannot tell you this, people. Everywhere I go, every pastor I listen to says the same thing. You need a small group. Every one of them. You know what he says? I lost my five-year-old daughter. I ran toward my pride, my small group. So let me ask you a question. Today, tough moment comes into your life. Who are you going to run to? Do you have enough people connected intimately to your life to be able to run into them with your situation? 
transparent? Can you cry in front of these people? Can you tell people the dark stuff of your life? That's what a pride of lion is are all about. That's what small groups are about. These tough moments of life, can you run to a group of people? And if you can't, ask God, where can I go? And you can go here, you can contact me or, or Tom and Lisa Jelnak or just get the word out, I want to be in a pride. Because if you take on one lion, you get, you get Nala, you get Simba, you, you get the whole bunch, okay? Even the bad lions sometimes are in your small group. But how important is it? Major. Second scare tactic. The first one is stick together. Second scare tactic is keep a short rope on your anchor. This is a cool analogy. This guy is very creative. I, I uh, listened to his message and thought, what do I do every Sunday? I'm just not very good. In, in the sense, it, it, this guy, this is a, he's a wonderful communicator. And so Levi says this about anchors. He says, there are no wireless anchors. <laughs> really? I tried that. It didn't work. You ever done this, right? Hey, throw the anchor over. <laughs> Was it tight on? Oh, no. That don't work too hot, right? Keep your anchor ropes short. Here's what he means by it. He says this. Your rope needs to be short because when the wind blows. So yesterday we were on a calm lake. But let's say we were on a really windy lake and we throw out the anchor. Okay, and then it calms down. And what has a tendency to happen on a boat is if you haven't tied it secure, right, now the boat drifts a little and the line gets longer and longer. You can also do this when you're skiing or tubing, right? The length of the rope, how much slack? It's coming back at you. Right? In, in skiing, right, all that slack, you say, hit it. If there's a lot of slack, what happens? About to fall on your face hard because you are going to get the big jolt. He says the same thing about a boat more your life. Keep your anchor rope short so when the storm comes, there's not that big kick. And he says that length of your anchor rope is your relationship with God. Sin lengthens the rope. You don't want to be close to God anymore unconfessed sin, addictions and things that you're just playing around with, that lengthens the rope, and now trouble comes in, the wind blows, and boom, there's a big hit, because when that rope goes taut, it's going to have a comeback moment. Keep the rope short. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Shorten the rope. Shorten the rope, because trouble is coming. See your stuff through this lens. The lens of look beyond. That's the ability to say this isn't all that's going to happen. I'm actually not a citizen here. I'm actually looking to my home. Look beyond. Have earnest expectations that yes, there's trouble coming, but I'm ready for my trouble through my faith. That's my exercise. Every day I'm exercising and staying on my toes because trouble's coming. And I want to engage the trouble for God's purposes. You have a new normal that's been created. Every time you go through a deep valley, you have a new normal. You have a passport now into the lives of other people. Your addiction that you currently are battling with God's help will become a passport to help another addict. Are you okay with that? It's the truth. Because those of us who are not addicts do not have a passport to someone who is. And it doesn't help us to say, oh, God will help you. Oh, pray more. They need someone with a passport. A wannabe mom who's had a miscarriage needs someone with a passport. You see, do you get it? A lonely person needs a lonely person. A passport of someone who says, I know what it was like. I didn't have any friends in high school either. Those are passports. That's your new normal. And finally, beyond the offensive, use scare tactics. It's coming in your direction, the difficulties of life, and be ready by surrounding yourself with the right group of people. Lions do it, right? Ducks and geese travel in flocks for a purpose because there's safety in that group. Also, there is that place to run to in that group. But you can't do it. You can't be in community with people if you won't be transparent. If you can't share the stuff of your life and and you're afraid, you can't be in real community. These are real communities. And the last part is confess. Keep your anchor rope short. 
I'm okay with this, everybody. I did the best I could to deliver his words to you because they so profoundly impacted me right when I needed them. For more on this, look up Levi Lusco. Next week, there will be at least 20 copies of his book here. You can buy them. I've read it. It's incredibly, incredibly good about how to deal with loss. But listen, everyone, we have, we have a new normal here. And I believe that new normal is going to be amazing. I think it's a snowball going down the hill. I think people are coming. They're coming to say, how are you people doing? And we're going to say, we're hurting. We lost. We're sad. But we're on our tiptoes. Because we believe that God is going to use us here. And we believe to honor Annie's life, it's not to back up. And ultimately just live in sorrow. It, it is sad, very sad. But we're going to go forward because we're one day closer to seeing her again. You are one day closer to somebody. Come on, you're one day closer to somebody that you've missed for a long time. And your heart aches to see them again. And your faith tells you you're one day closer. Let's stand. God, this morning I'm aware that you know, words kind of fall. You give a lot of them for very little sometimes. But this isn't that time when, when there, there are words, essentially. There, there are words that you need us to hear. It's, it's how this time has affected us. And this is just a microcosm. This place here with one loss is just this little example. I mean, there, there are communities all around that are suffering the loss right now. And, and we want to be people who are learning in our loss and, and moving and growing and going deeper with God in our loss because we believe that it's the way you're going to use us. I, I wish my life, God, was a better reflection of growing when things were easy, but it's not. It seems like almost all my depth and my growth has come from when it's really hard. i got to learn. We have to learn. You don't waste anything, God. You're not wasting these moments. You're not wasting our sorrow. You're not wasting our struggle. You're using it. You're using it in us. And you want to use it through us. Help us to be salt and light. Courageous people who, who live life and do battle on their tiptoes, engaging the difficult moments. We don't, have question, we don't have answers for the question. There's too big of questions out there. But what we have is real life and real faith. Thanks for the courageous people in this room right here. Thank you for that. This week, people approached me, either sent me a message or approached me and said, God is taking full control of my life. Yep, that's understanding you don't waste anything. We're yours. Do with us, God. You're the potter. We're the clay. Mold us and shape us. And anyone standing in this room, don't pass this significant moment by. It might be the hardest moment you've ever faced. Don't pass it by. Engage it. The promise of Scripture is you will have trouble in this world, but take heart because I have overcome. Whatever you're facing today, he has overcome. God, send us from this place courageous warriors for your cause. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.